Father, we, we thank you. We thank you, Lord, that you do have open doors uh, for us to walk through um, to minister to people that you want to know you. Um, and Lord, we thank you that you have given us, first of all, your Holy Spirit. And you've called us to share the love that you've shown us, share the, the fruit of your Holy Spirit with others. And Lord, we just pray that you would lead us in um, whatever that is, in, in whatever capacity you want us to do that. And Lord, as we, uh, we pray this morning, we also we bring Evie before you. Lord, we just pray that you would heal her. We pray for blessings over her. We pray for peace right now um, as she's in her hospital bed. Lord, we pray that you would just encourage her and let her be a light. We, she's a light. There's no doubt about it. We get to see it all the time. Lord, we just pray that you would use her as a light there as well. And bless Bill as he ministers to his wife. Strengthen them, encourage them, and keep them safe. And uh, Lord, we... As we get into your word this morning, we ask you to teach us. I mean, we just we just want to learn. We just want to receive. We just want to hear. Uh, we just want you to have your way in our lives, and we just want you to change whatever needs to be changed or remind us or whatever may, we may have forgotten, Lord. But most of all, Lord Jesus, we just want you to be glorified. And so if there's someone here this morning, I know there's all of us, every one of us have have a need. We all need to hear from you. But for someone here this morning who is far away or someone that is, um, maybe they don't know you at all, Lord Jesus, we pray today would be the day that they would come to know you. Today may be the day that they come back to you. We just want you to have your way in this service, Lord Jesus. In your name we pray. Amen. Amen. Ephesians chapter 4. We start in verse 7. And uh, we've seen a lot over the weeks that we've been in this study of the letter to the Ephesians. Paul's taught amazing truths uh, for the, through the first few chapters of who God is and what he's done for us. He's taught the reality of um, what we have in Jesus. He's uh, taught the reality of who we are in him, um, that we're not separated from God by our sin anymore. Uh, those of us that have surrendered... Uh, to Jesus and his lordship have been brought close. We now have intimacy with God. We are his own children of his own household through the blood of Jesus, through his atoning sacrifice on his cross. And in this common fellowship that we all now have with Jesus, um, your fellowship with him on a personal level, my fellowship with him on a personal level, our fellowship with him on our own personal levels, we now have commonality in our relationship with him. We all have this, his Holy Spirit in common, and this gives us fellowship with each other. Um, the unity we have with Jesus brings unity between us. And this unity is something, as we talked about last week, that the Lord's provided for his church. He purchased it, he's provided it, and now we're called to keep it. Like, we're called to continue in it. Last week in verse 1, Paul said, I therefore... The prisoner of the Lord beseech you to walk worthy of the calling with which you are called. Paul says, walk worthy. Like walk in a way that shows who your Savior is. Walk in a way that shows who you are in him with lowliness and gentleness, with long-suffering, bearing with one another in love. Uh, walk in a way with each other that we want Jesus to walk with us, right? Show each other what we want to receive from Jesus and do this in a way, you know, if we do this, it promotes unity in his body. Like if we walk in this way, unity naturally happens. And to do this, like to walk this out, uh, to accomplish what God has for his church, he's given all of us differing gifts to walk in. And Paul's going to address some of these gifts here in chapter four. Um, he's going to address how they function in the church and how they're uh, like, how they're supposed to work, like what their purpose is. So starting in verse 7, we're going to read all the way down uh, to verse 16, and then we'll come back and we'll, we'll look at each verse. But to each one of us, grace was given according to the measure of Christ's gift. 
Therefore, he says, when he ascended on high, he led captivity captive and gave gifts to men. Now this he ascended. What does it mean? But he, that he also descended, first descended into the lower parts of the earth. He who descended is also the one who is ascended far above all heavens that he might fill all things. And he himself gave some to be apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, and some pastors and teachers for the equipping of the saints, for the work of ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ, till we all come to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God, to a perfect man, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, that we should no longer be children tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine, by the trickery of men and the cunning craftiness of deceitful plotting, but speaking the truth in love, may grow up in all things into him who is the head, Christ, from whom the whole body, joined and knit together by what every joint supplies, according to the effective working by which every part does its share, causes growth of the body for the edifying of itself in love. So Paul says, but to each one of us grace was given according to the measure of Christ's gift. So we see here, first of all, that the gifts we have inside the body of Christ are given by Jesus. They are grace. They're unmerited favor. Uh, they're given uh, not because of worthiness on somebody's part. Like these gifts aren't given because God has favorites or that he sees something just extra special in one person over another. These gifts are given by God in his wisdom for his plan by his grace. Like he knows what he's doing. Even though sometimes we may ask, like, do you know what you're doing? He knows what he's doing. And we also see that these gifts are given in that um, the measure that Christ decides to give them. Um, and there's a really good reason for that. Romans 12 says, For I say, through the grace given to me, to everyone who is among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think soberly, as God has dealt to each one a measure of faith. For as we have many members in one body, but all the members do not have the same function, so we, being many, are one body in Christ and individually members of one another. Having then gifts differing according to the grace that is given to us, let us use them. If prophecy, let us prophesy in proportion to our faith. Or ministry, let us use it in our ministering. He who teaches in teaching, he who exhorts in exhortation, he who gives with liberality, he who leads with diligence, he who shows mercy with cheerfulness. And Peter echoes this in uh, 1 Peter chapter 4. He says, as each one has received a gift, minister it to one another as good stewards of the manifold grace of God. If anyone speaks, let him speak as the oracles of God. If anyone ministers, let him do it as with the ability which God supplies, that in all things God may be glorified through Jesus Christ, to whom belong the glory and the dominion forever and ever. Amen. I mean, you see the purpose here? Uh, These gifts are given in a measure that suits Jesus in a way that makes sure the glory goes where it should. There's a reason I can't can't preach like Spurgeon, and and it's because you wouldn't get my head through those double doors if if I could. Like, I I don't preach like Spurgeon, so I won't think of myself more than I should. Obviously, Spurgeon can handle it. I probably can't. So I preach and I teach with the measure that Christ has given me. And in that, I pray that he's glorified in it, like not me, but him. And I know and I've learned that if there's any good that comes out of what I do or what you do, it's because of Jesus and his grace, like he gets the glory. It's all about Jesus. And in verse 8 through 10, Paul says, Therefore, he says, when he ascended on high, he led captivity captive and gave gifts to men. Now this he ascended, what does it mean, but, all, but that he also first descended to the lower parts of the earth. He who descended is also the one who ascended far above all the heavens, that he might fill all things. Now Paul quotes Psalm sixty-eight, eighteen here in verse 8. You may see that in your notes. But he quotes it in a different way. It's kind of interesting. Uh, Psalm sixty-eight, eighteen in the book of Psalms says, You have ascended on high, you have led captivity captive, You have received gifts among men, even from the rebellious, that the Lord God might dwell there. So Paul says that Jesus gave gifts to men, not received them. So what's up with this? 
Some say, like this is Paul quoting from a different form of Psalm 68, 18, like from an ancient translation called the Targum. Um, I think there might be something else here. Um, I think that by the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, Paul's quoting this verse in light of Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection. Like, I think he's quoting Psalm 68 as a completed verse, an Old Testament verse completed in Jesus. And, and hear me out why I think that. In Colossians chapter 2, it says, And you being dead in your trespasses and the uncircumcision of your flesh, he has made alive together with him, having forgiven you all trespasses, having wiped out the handwriting requirements that was against us, which was contrary to us. And he has taken it out of the way, having nailed it to the cross. Now listen. Having disarmed principalities and powers, he made a public spectacle of them, triumphing over them in it. So at the cross, Jesus made a public spectacle out of the enemy. Like we've talked about that. Uh, Jesus embarrassed Satan publicly at the cross, taking what the enemy meant for the destruction of the hope of mankind, Jesus. Jesus used it to accomplish his plan to save mankind, right? It's pretty embarrassing. Um, And when Jesus defeated Satan, when he rose again, he was lifted above all. Like, tribute was given to Jesus by his enemies that day. Uh, The enemy had to relinquish his authority and control. Do you get that? Like, the authority and the control that Satan thought he had, when he was defeated, he had to relinquish that. He had to pay tribute to Jesus. After his resurrection, it says in Matthew 28, And Jesus came and spoke to them, saying, and this, this verse is very popular, but listen to what he's saying. All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. And he says, go therefore. Like, because I have overcome the world, because I have all authority, go therefore and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. The one who has overcome, the one who has all authority, as we go out, he's with us. That means something, right? Jesus has the victory over his enemies. The, the tribute's been paid to him. All authority is his. Everything is his. So now he gives. Does that make sense? He gives gifts to men. He doesn't receive. He gives. He, doesn't, he isn't getting the tribute from the enemy anymore. He has it. Now he gives. He offers the free gift of salvation to all those who receive it. And he gives gifts to his children. He gives the gift of the Holy Spirit and the gifts of the Holy Spirit. So we we can walk in the power and the grace and the love and the victory that he's called us to. And in this, which is, I think this is a really cool thought, in this giving of the gifts to his children, to us, Jesus continues to parade his defeated enemy in front of the world. Like, he does this by the evidence of his victory in our lives. Like, in the ground that the enemy loses in our lives, as we continue to surrender ourselves to Jesus, the enemy is paraded in defeat because he's losing what he had in us, right? When we turn away from sin and turn to Jesus, the enemy is paraded in defeat. When we choose to love in spite of all the obstacles, the enemy is shown as a defeated foe in this world. And that's really cool to me. Like as we're being sanctified by the Holy Spirit, the enemy is embarrassed by the victories happening in our lives. I I like that. Now, while we're in this section, I want to take a kind of an academic look at verses 9 and 10 a little bit. And there's a, there's a couple different ways to look at this. It's not a serious doctrinal thing, but since we're students of God's word, it's worth our time to look at it while we're here. Now, verses 9 and 10 again say, Now this, he ascended. What does it mean? But he also first descended into the lower parts of the earth. What, um, like, what is Paul talking about when he says that he, speaking of Jesus, first descended into the lower parts of the earth? Uh, What are the lower parts of the earth? Some believe that this verse is talking about Jesus' ascent from heaven to the earth itself. Like, um, that's a long ways. Uh, Some believe Paul's referring to the descent to the grave. 
Uh, like when Jesus speaks of the sign of Jonah in Matthew 12, he says, For as Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of the great fish, so will the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. Many think that Paul's referring to the tomb here by saying the lower parts of the earth. And this could be. But there could be something more than that like that Paul's talking about here. Some believe that after the crucifixion, the Lord literally went and took the keys to death and hell. Um, Revelation 1 says, And when I saw him, I fell at his feet as dead. But he laid his right hand on me, saying to me, Do not be afraid. I am the first and the last. I am he who lives and was dead. And behold, I am alive forevermore. Amen. I have the keys of Hades and of death. Uh, Many believe that Jesus literally stormed Hades and took the keys. And then went and preached the gospel to those who were Abraham's bosom. In Luke twenty three forty three, Jesus tells this thief on the cross that was beside him, Surely I say to you, today you will be with me in paradise. He was speaking of where he was about to go. First uh, Peter 3 says, For Christ also suffered once for sins, the just for the unjust, that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, that but made alive by the Spirit, by whom also he went and preached to the spirits in prison, who formerly were disobedient, when once the divine longsuffering waited in the days of Noah, while the ark was being prepared, in which a few, that is, eight souls, were saved through water. In the very next chapter, First Peter chapter 4 for we have spent enough of our past lifetime in doing the will of the Gentiles. We walked in lewdness, lust, drunkenness, revelries, drinking, parties, and abominable idolatries. In regard to these, they think it strange that you do not run with them in the same flood of dissipation, speaking evil of you. They will give an account to him who is ready to judge the living and the dead. For this reason, the gospel was preached also to those who are dead, that they might be judged according to the men in the flesh, but live according to God in the Spirit. It's interesting stuff there. Um, we know that there's one way to salvation. Whether you lived in the Old Testament times or the New Testament times, there's one way, and that's Jesus. Right? There's one way to the Father. So by this truth and, and by these verses that we've looked at, many believe that Jesus went and preached to those who died before the cross so they could come through him. And it says in Matthew 27, and this gets even wilder. If you were, if you were there, you would have, it would have blown me away anyway if I was there. It says, Then behold, the veil of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom, and the earth quaked, and the rocks were split, and the graves were opened. And many bodies of the saints who had fallen asleep were raised. And coming out of the graves, uh, graves after the resurrection, they went into the holy city and peered to many. Like that's, that's something. <laughs> You know, and these these people may have been those who Jesus preached to. And when they were resurrected by the gospel, by hearing the gospel, I guarantee they didn't just appear to like to people to just say howdy. Like they came and they preached the gospel that they just heard. I could just see these folks walking around, these dead people that had been dead, walking around alive, resurrected, preaching the gospel to people. And you, you know, you can study that out and you see what you think. But here's the main thing, you know, we need to see here in these verses. Jesus is just like Paul writes here in verse 10. It says, he who descended is also he who has ascended far above all the heavens, that he might fill all things. Jesus descended from heaven. Like, this is the amazing thing. He descended from heaven to the earth, like from his glory to live among us, which is an unimaginable, unmeasurable distance. But he also descended to the grave. Like the immortal king of kings came in mortal flesh and died a mortal death. And then he ascended back to his rightful place, victorious. And in doing so, Jesus put Satan in his rightful place, making him a defeated foe. As Paul said back in chapter 1 in Ephesians in verse 22 and 23, and he put all things under his feet and gave him to be head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills all in all. This is where we come into this. He chose to show this, you know, his greatness, his, his victory, his authority through his church. He's given us gifts by his spirit in his grace, so we'll give him the glory he deserves in our lives, in his church, in front of the world. 
picking up in verse 11, Paul says, and he himself gave some to be apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, and some pastors and teachers. Now, I would love to just move on from this little section and just keep teaching. But this is, it seems, have you noticed the more we talk about unity, the more we come across scriptures that seem to cause division? Um, It's pretty ironic to me. And and this is a very heavily disputed portion of scripture. Uh, A couple of these gifts that, you know, Paul's going to, Paul talks about here um, and what they mean causes a lot of contention among the brethren. As for me, I'm going to tell you my viewpoint, um, and then you can go study and pray about it. I think these gifts in this portion of Scripture should be looked at in two ways. In the context of the world and the church that Paul lived in when he wrote this letter, and, and in the context of the world that we live in today. Uh, context is important, right? Right? When we study the word, context, that's why we study the way we study, verse by verse, chapter by chapter, context matters. The prophets and apostles that Paul's referring to here in chapter 4 are the same people he's referring to in chapter 3. Like, he's not changed who he's talking about here. If you want to turn back um, to chapter 3, looking at verse 1 real quick. He says, for this reason, I, Paul, the prisoner of Christ Jesus, for you Gentiles, if indeed you have heard of the dispensation of the grace of God, which was given to me for you, how that by revelation he made known to me the mystery, as I have briefly written already, by which when you read, you may understand my knowledge in the mystery of Christ, which in other ages was not made known to the sons of men, as it has now been revealed by the Holy Spirit, by the Spirit to his holy apostles and prophets. So he's talking about that the Gentiles should be fellow heirs of the same body. This is the revelation of the mystery and partakers of his promise in Christ through the gospel of which I became a minister according to the gift of the grace of God given to me by the effective working of his power. So the apostles and prophets are the ones that God revealed the mystery of the gospel to. God used them to reveal the mystery of the Old Testament scriptures as they're talking about Jesus. They revealed Jesus through the Old Testament. And these are the ones Paul says in the church that the, the church was built on. Uh, he says in chapter 2, starting in verse 19, if you want to look there real quick, since you're close. It says, Now therefore, you are no longer strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God, having be- been built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets. Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone in whom the whole building being fitted together grows into a holy temple in the Lord in whom you also are being built together for a dwelling place of God in the Spirit. Now, we read this and we have to understand this was really important for the Ephesians to get. Like He's writing to the Ephesians and the Ephesians need to get this. They needed to know what Paul was saying here. It was important for the pastors and teachers of this time to get this. This was good instruction for them. First of all, in the Greek, the office spoken here as, as pastor teacher is one office. Um, it's it, he listen to what it, this is grammatical here, and I'm I, I'm awful at grammar. So, like, just understand, this is what the Greek says. This is what is what Trent says. This is what the Greek says, and he himself gave some to be apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, and some pastors and teachers. You notice the difference there? It's not some pastors and some teachers. It's some pastors, teachers. This is saying, like, um, first of all, this isn't saying that you have to be a pastor to teach. But you do have to be a teacher if you're a pastor. Does that make sense? You can't be a pastor and not teach, but you can be a teacher and not pastor. The main point is that in the Greek... Here in this passage, I'm not saying there's not a separate gift of teaching, but in this passage, Paul's speaking of four offices in the church. The apostle, the prophet, the evangelist, and the pastor-teacher. And in the time of Paul, the pastor-teacher operated differently than they do today. In that the pastors didn't have the New Testament to teach from. Like they didn't have our Bible. Can you imagine being a pastor-teacher during that time? Like they didn't have Paul's letters to look to for moral conduct. And to explain a lot of these doctrines. They had the Old Testament. 
And they had the oral testimonies of the ones who'd walked with Jesus and the ones who'd witnessed his resurrection. They had the word established by the apostles and prophets. They're the foundation. Um, They were the ones that these guys referenced. Uh, What the Holy Spirit had revealed to the likes of Peter, John, James, and Paul, and the other guys, this was what these pastors leaned on to lead and teach their flocks. Does that make sense? Okay. And it's the writings of like these same apostles and prophets, like we lean on them still today, right? Like we're still, like this book is written. This book is complete. Like the, the, the same apostles and prophets that were that Paul's talking about here are the ones that wrote this book and that we've got, and it's complete. And I'm thankful for that. Like, um, look, I'm not saying that we can't have apostles and prophets today. I'm not a cessationist, um, secessionist, cessationist. Secessionist means I want to leave the union. Cessationist means I, I believe in the gifts. Okay. I'm not a secessionist. Don't clip that out and put that on YouTube. <laughs> I'll be on MSNBC or somewhere. So I'm not saying that we can't have apostles and prophets today, but I'm saying we don't have them in the role of the apostles and prophets that Paul's referring to here. Um, Not those who were revealing the mystery of Jesus and revealing the inspired word of God. And and, and I'm I'm thankful for the way the Lord did it. Like I'm thankful for this word that it stopped, that it was closed. Because of his word, we can now look in our day and see what apostles and prophets are supposed to look like. Like um, the word for apostle is apostolos. Uh, it, it does, and it doesn't mean, I'll tell you what it doesn't mean. It doesn't mean exalted one. It, it, like some of the people that call themselves apostles seem to think these days. It means one that's sent forth. Uh, in the biblical usage, it, it really means a super messenger, like an extra special messenger. In that, God's given this person, this one that's called, an extra measure of the outpouring of the Holy Spirit to go and represent Jesus somewhere. Um, There are those today that would probably fit this bill. Um, Those who are given the calling of going and establishing great moves of God in areas around the world. They're there. They're around. Um, There are also people who prophesy today. There's no doubt. People that speak into people's lives from God. Um, But here's the thing. You usually don't hear these people proclaiming themselves as apostles and prophets. Um, A lot of folks that are calling themselves or proclaiming themselves as apostles and prophets today, they seem to want authority over people, that they seem to want followers. And that's a sure sign that there's a problem. Jesus gave us a model of what authority should look like in the church, right? When James and John's mama asked Jesus to make her sons, you know, give her sons authority in the kingdom, it says in Matthew 20, and when the 10 heard it, they were greatly displeased with the two brothers. But Jesus called them to himself and said, you know that the rulers of the Gentiles lorded over them. And those who are great exercise authority over them. Yet it shall not be so among you. But whoever desires to be a, become great among you, let him be your servant. And whoever desires to be first among you, let him be your slave. Just as the Son of Man did not come to serve, be served, but to serve. And, excuse me. And to give his life a ransom for many. I tend to find that, you know, those who were apostles in the Bible, they didn't demand authority. You notice that? Like Paul sure didn't. In fact, the apostles of the Bible seem to have gotten the opposite from people, but they just kept on serving the Lord. Do you know what Jesus said he hated? When speaking of the church in Ephesus in Revelation 2, he says, but this you have, that you hate the deeds of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. Now there's some debate over who these people are, but the word Nicolaitan is derived from two words. The word Nico meaning to overcome, and the word laos, meaning people. So Nicolaitan means to overcome people. And many believe the Nicolaitans were of the priest over layman doctrine. Like they were those who wanted authority over people. And there's no need for a priest to be over God's people anymore because he is our priest. Jesus is to have authority in your life, not a person. And as a pastor, I don't have authority in your life. Like, I'm to, I'm, I'm to guard the church as an under-shepherd, right? 
I'm to instruct and teach the church as an under shepherd. And in doing that, hopefully, prayerfully, I'm pointing you to your true authority, God and his word. Now, listen, like I, I'm just saying, be careful when it comes to people calling themselves apostles and prophets, like if they proclaim it. There's a lot of people reclaiming this type of authority right now, and they're getting authority in people's lives, and they're getting rich off people. Remember, the flesh wants to present itself as spiritual. That's one of Pastor Jim Coy's really good lines. So how do we make sure? Like, like how do we stay safe? How do we be wise as serpents and gentle as doves? First, we hold everything up to Scripture. God is the same yesterday, today, and forever, and he doesn't change, and he doesn't contradict himself. So we hold it up to his word. We hold it up to scrutiny. If somebody prophesies and it doesn't happen, they're not a prophet. In fact, Deuteronomy 18 says, But the prophet who presumes to speak in my what word in my name, which I have not commanded him to speak, or who speaks in the name of other gods, that prophet shall die. And if you say in your heart, how shall we know the word which the Lord has not spoken? When the prophet speaks in the name of the Lord, if the thing does not happen or come to pass, that is the thing which the Lord has not spoken. Because what the Lord speaks happens. The prophet has spoken it presumptuously. You shall not be afraid of him. Now, we're not about going to, you know, around killing people, but obviously this is serious business. Like God takes this serious. So be careful who you listen to. And like God may give someone a word that you need to hear, but it'll line up with God's written word. And that's why we need to know it. And understand this, like know this about prophecy. Prophecy wasn't always about future events. Like there's a lot of people that want their future told. And just remember the, the enemy uses fortune tellers too. Prophecy isn't just foretelling. A lot of times it's forth telling, meaning that uh, many times prophecy is proclaiming the things of God's word. Um, I get a text message. I'm not trying to give out of boys or anything or out of girls, but I get text messages from people that have a word. Uh, Nathan McPhee's like, that dude, I, I'm not calling him a prophet, but the dude, God uses that guy as a prophet. And I'll tell you how. He doesn't say, tomorrow, Trent, you're really going to have a good day. Or you're going to make, you know, more money last next year than you did this year. He doesn't say stuff like that. What he does say, though, he sends me a scripture that's on his mind that God's put on his heart to share with me. And, man, I'm telling you, I can't tell you how many times I've been like, yeah, it's exactly what I need to hear. That's forth telling, right? That's, that's, that's someone being led by God, not knowing what's going on in my life. God knows. And God deciding to share it through my brother. Here's the thing, and, and Nathan knows this, and any of us that, you know, really want to be used by God know this. It's not about us. It's about Jesus. And a true apostle or prophet is going to point to Jesus. They're never going to point to themselves. The manifestations of the, the spiritual gifts are to point to Jesus, not so somebody can have four jets and a couple mansions. I don't care what they say. Now, let's go over the other two offices. Um, evangelist and pastor teacher. Uh, the evangelist is a bringer of good news. Um, there are definitely evangelists today. Uh, but these are those who have this gift of sharing the gospel in a way that maybe not every, everyone has. Like we're all called to make Jesus known, like to know him and make him known. But there's some people who God's called to do it in a way that's just different. I mean, Billy Graham, evangelist, great evangelist. Uh, Greg Laurie, Great evangelist. Um, and probably some of y'all here have a gift of evangelism. But again, the evangelist doesn't point to himself or exalt himself. Like I never heard Billy Graham exalt himself. Maybe you guys did. I didn't. Uh, Greg Laurie, if he ever did, he was out of line. But I never saw that. It was always Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. Um, the evangelist always points to Jesus and the good news that's found in him. And we've already talked a little bit about pastor teacher. You know, he's the under shepherd the one who, to tend the flock of God, to feed them, to seek to protect them from the predators, and always, always to be pointing to the one true shepherd of our souls, Jesus. And these offices that Paul listed um, here are appointed by Jesus. They're not appointed by man. These are callings. God gives the gifts. God raises up. He'll make it known. We just follow him, right? 
Um, when God does it, when God puts someone in a position, it's good. When man puts somebody in a position, not good. It doesn't go well. And I'll tell you this, you know, if you look in God's word and see how many apostles and prophets um, or evangelists or pastors, see how many of them went looking for the calling. Like how many went looking to be an apostle or a prophet or evangelist or a pastor. They just wanted to follow God, whatever it looked like. And many did it reluctantly. And many people that I know that walk in these offices go kicking and screaming. You gotta, God's got to drag them in there. But we walk in obedience because God is doing the calling. And we just want to serve him, right? In verse 12, Paul's going to tell us what these callings are for. He says they're for the equipping of the saints, for the work of ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ, till we all come to the unity of the faith and the knowledge of the Son of God, to a perfect man, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. These gifts are given to equip the saints for the work that God's called them to do, to go and minister in the church and in the world. The offices Paul's listed are to build up the body of Christ. Um, until we all come to the unity of the faith. Like, it's not about the one who's called. It's about what God's doing. It's about the, the, the purpose of the, the one who has called. They're to, these gifts are to build unity. To, like, and, and when you think about that, like, really, you know, as we talked about, we all have these different places, and even as we talked about some of these doctrines and some of these things that we've looked at even today that we may disagree on, we can still have unity, um, these gifts are to bring us to a place that we're all on the same page about what it means to be a follower of Christ, uh, that we all come to a place where we major in the majors. You understand? Like if we all are here major in the majors and we, we, we can disagree, agree, disagree in the minors, we'll have unity. And all of us together in Christ would be perfected in Christ, in his love. That's what these gifts are for. And again, like we've seen in the prayer at the end of chapter 3, Paul goes big here. He says that we detain to the stature of the fullness of Christ. Like, here's the goal, that you in your life would come to the stature of the fullness of Christ, that we as a body would come to the stature of the fullness of Christ. And it's so important, like, that we get past the um, amazement of that, of that phrase we get past the, you know, the, the hurdle that we have in our mind that how can that happen for us? God's saying it, so that means he wants to do it. It's so important that we seek this, that we seek to grow up in this way. So because we, we want to be and we need to be strong in the Lord. Paul says in verse 14 that we should no longer be children tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine by the trickery of men and the cunning craftiness of deceitful plotting, but speaking the truth in love, may grow up in all things into him who is the head, Christ, from whom the whole body joined and knit together by what every joint supplies according to the effect of working by which every part does its share causes growth of the body for the edifying of itself in love. And we are to be built up in Christ. We are to be unified in Christ. We are to speak the truth and we're always to do it in love. We're to grow up into Jesus so we won't be tossed to and fro with every wind of doctrine. So we won't be controlled by people and influenced by people who just want to take advantage of us by cunning and craftiness. Those that just want followers and fame. So, so really, if you looked at this, you could, you could say spiritual maturity is marked by unity. Spiritual maturity is marked by not being influenced by every wind of doctrine. So we have a good spiritual maturity test here. Like, are we swayed by all kinds of doctrines? Like everything, every time something comes along, are we swayed by it? Or are we being swayed by all kinds of teachers? Like we hear this person, we hear this person, we're just over here and over there. Or are we growing into the maturity that is marked by unity in Christ? There's a lot of people that have been duped into thinking that spiritual maturity is what the guy or the girl on the internet or the TV says it is. And spiritual maturity is what this word says. You remember Harold Camping? Any of y'all? He predicted the end of the world like three or four times, right? He made millions selling his books. Millions. 
And, you know, like if you wanted to, you know, be in the know, if you wanted to be ready and make sure everybody else was ready, you need to buy his book because the world was going to end. And then it was going to end. And then it was going to end. And then it was going to end. But if his followers would have been mature in the Lord, if they'd have been mature in the Lord's word, they'd known that no one knows the day or the hour of Christ's return. They'd know to get ready. Like we need to get ready. We need to share Jesus. But the book about that's already been written, right? Like I don't need his book for that. And there were all kinds of books about um, Y2K. Y'all remember that? So I got, real quick, I'm running out of time already, but me and Bridget, like, I got saved two months before Y2K happened. End of 1999. And we had, I, I was one of those, before I got, I did a 180. So before I got saved, I was a heathen, conspiracist, had just, I'm not saying that if you guys have these things, you are the same, but I'm saying like I had, I was anticipating the overthrow of the government and I had thousands of rounds of ammo. I was spending all, I was selling all my weed and buying guns and ammo. And I had barrels and barrels and barrels of black beans and rice. So I get saved right before Y2K. Like I did all this preparation for Y2K and then I get saved. And it's like, Okay, now I got to trust the Lord. And so me and Bridget spent that evening, that, they used to do these watch services here where we would you'd go into the church on New Year's Eve and you would stay all night until through midnight, or not all night, up through midnight, and bring in the New Year worshiping the Lord. And so we were in a service. And you know what? We just worshiped the Lord. And there was preaching and singing, and, and we didn't even know that midnight had passed. And somebody mentioned, you know, went up and said, well, we're still here and the lights are still on. And I don't know how long it took me and Bridget to eat them black beans and rice, but we probably still got some. But if I'd been mature in the Lord, you know, I might have bought a little something to put back. There's nothing wrong with that. But it wouldn't have been a stockpile, and it wouldn't have been out of fear. My trust would have been in the Lord. And, and things look bad right now in a lot of ways, right? I mean, things look bad, and there's plenty of people seeking to control people with fear. And I'm going to tell you, beware when people are scaring you and then asking you for money at the same time. That's, a, that's not a good combo. And beware when people are all about the same things all the time. Like they don't teach any, on anything but the bad news all the time. They want followers. It's clickbait. Listen, look to Jesus and the whole counsel of his word. Be encouraged. Don't be afraid. We don't have to be anxious. The Lord teaches us not to worry about tomorrow, right? And, and, and that wasn't an optional teaching. Like, that's the something he said expecting us to do. It's a teaching on faith. Like, he's teaching us on trusting the Lord no matter what. And this is something the Lord's really been doing a work in my life. Like, uh, even, even lately, he's been teaching me and encouraging me to take my fears to him, to take my cares and cast them on him because he cares for me. And because really, he's the only one that can do anything about any of them anyway. Right? Christian, we just need to grow up in him. We just need to get settled in the truth of God's word. And the truth of who he is. And the truth of who we are in him. We need to get so settled that we trust what he says. Even when the doubt tries to come in. Or even when, the, when others come along to influence us. We need to be so settled in God's grace that the person on YouTube or the podcast and even the doctor's office, that we, they won't be able to shake us because God's word is still true and he's faithful. And we're all doing this together. We're all growing up in this together. We're all going to need each other in this. All of us, as we walk in our callings, we're all being knit together by what every joint in the body provides as every part, me and you, as we do our part, as we do our share, we grow together as we love each other and build each other up in that love. Chuck Smith said this, the primary purpose of the church isn't to convert sinners to Christianity. That sounds shocking, but to perfect, complete and mature the saints for the ministry and edification of the body. The church is to be the church first. It's to know Jesus, then to make him known. If a church isn't growing in Jesus, like if a church doesn't grow in Jesus, then it'll show the world something that's fleshly, right? 
will show the world us. It'll show the world something that looks like religion or like looks like the world itself. But if we grow up into Jesus together, all of us will show the world who he is. Amen. I just want to finish with just encouragement. If Jesus is your Savior, then you're part of the body, right? But let me say this, and maybe maybe somebody needs to hear this, maybe not. I, I would have needed to hear this early on. There's no pressure to, like, find your spiritual gift right this second. Like, don't stress about that. As you seek the gift, like, seek God for the gift, but don't try to force it. Seek Jesus. You know, the word tells us he's the better way, right? He's love. Seek him and his righteousness and all these other things will be added to you. God will do what he wants. God will use you in his body if you seek him first. So just seek him. Seek to grow up in him. Seek to encourage your brothers and sisters. Trust me, they need encouragement. There ain't one person here who doesn't need encouragement in some way. When you speak the truth, speak it in love. Speak it to build up. And watch what the Lord does in your life. Watch how he uses you in this church. And then watch what he does with you in the world. And if you're here and you don't know Jesus, like I would be shocked with a crowd this size. Um, There wouldn't be somebody here that doesn't know the Lord. If you don't know him, if that's you, you're spiritually dead. Sin has killed us because it separates us from God because God is life. He is our life. Like the blood pumping through your veins, we, we call that life, right? Like that's, that's life. But because of the fall, because of our separation from God, that's going to stop flowing one day. This thing we call life, that we call life, is going to stop. I'm going to mention this really quick. You guys know who Howard Stern is, right? Okay, and if you're a fan of Howard Stern, I'm, I'm not trying to, well, yeah, God bless your heart. So, <laughs> this is where I usually stick my foot in it. So, Howard Stern, he's not very, he's not very, um, he doesn't think a lot of Christians. And so, um, he thinks that Christians are, that we're weak, that, you know, he, I've heard him say a lot of things over the years, but you know what, I pray for him. You know, I'm no better than him. By the grace of God, there am I. But right now, he's not been out of his house in years, right? And it's not as much about the virus as much as he's afraid to die, right? This man who doesn't believe in God, who's completely been accepting that whatever happens to him over the years Now he's facing his mortality and he's afraid to death. We don't have to be afraid of death. Howard Stern doesn't have to be afraid of death if he comes to Christ. And all he has to do is come. Howard Stern, I'd love to see him get baptized. That would be awesome. God's doing that kind of thing. Jesus is our life. Jesus said in John 11, and whoever lives and believes in me shall never die. He says, do you believe this? Come to Jesus. If you don't know him, come to Jesus. Receive life without end. You can come up here and someone would love to pray with you and they'd love to answer any questions you might have or you can surrender your life to Jesus right where you are. And we're going to take a few minutes as Pastor Jim plays to spend some time with the Lord. If you need prayer for any reason, uh, please come. Spend this time as the Lord leads you.